This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. General programming tells us to be in control and fill our space with things, even our minds. In the East, it even appears that we are supposed to control our thoughts with meditation, forcing our focus back to our breath. Although this appears to be a form of control, it's actually at its most extreme a form of mastery. Meditation is a way for us to slow down create more space and sit in that space so that we can gain insight, accept, and respond to life in kind and thoughtful ways. Sitting in a lot of space can be very uncomfortable. Imagine sitting with someone in silence when you're not meditating or doing anything else physical together. Awkward, right? Especially if you don't know someone well. You usually try to fill that space with words, TV, or something. So take that concept one step further. If we're not filling the space or controlling our thoughts, we're just being there, allowing things to be as they are. It's a feeling of being present and experiencing pure relaxation. But fear, or whatever else that may be buried, may also naturally come to the surface. When Heather was in her mid-twenties, she started dating someone who meditated himself. She'd been curious about it, but was never as called to do it as she was in that moment. He talked to her about the kind of meditation he did, which was called vipassana, or insight meditation. At the time, he had been to several retreats that lasted up to a month, 10-day and one-month-long retreats being the most common. Heather laughed at the idea of going on a month-long retreat, but started by just sitting and breathing. She would sit for 10 minutes or so once or twice a week, and although it felt really awkward, she just kept at it. Nearly 20 years later, and after several workshops and retreats, Heather meditates now every day for at least 30 minutes, and sometimes twice if the day has been difficult. This is what meditation helps her cultivate. Self-acceptance and acceptance of others. Compassion for self and others. Clarity about people and situations in both her private and professional lives. Emotional, psychological, energetic freedom. Mastery over her own thoughts, feelings, and actions, which includes a shift from knee-jerk reactions to more thoughtful responses. Now, she can see things more clearly. She is more grounded, has greater awareness of where that boundary is between others and herself feels more relaxed and connected to herself and others, can see bullshit really easily and tell when people lie to her, she is able to focus in meetings and do better work, especially work that requires attention to detail, has a greater sense of well-being as though everything will be okay, really sees the humor in herself and situations. It's like a natural, magical practice that leads to greater peace wisdom, and happiness, says Heather. Valeria interviews Heather Gwaltney. She offers mindfulness meditation sessions for companies and individuals and provides organizational and communications consulting. She has worked for over 20 years in the private, nonprofit, and education sectors. 
has taught courses at George Mason University and delivered in-person and online trainings for numerous private companies and nonprofits. Heather holds a master's in organizational development and a bachelor's in psychology with a business minor. As a 20-year veteran of meditation and energy work, her certifications include mindfulness meditation, master level Reiki, and permaculture design. Heather's meditation teachings mimics her own journey with the practice. She began practicing Vipassana meditation, now largely referred to as mindfulness meditation, while working in the corporate world. As she continued the practice, she has learned how to apply it both to her personal and professional lives. Therefore, works with others to apply it to theirs. She uses practical, non-religious approach with compassion and humor and can customize her sessions to meet the needs of her clients. Here is the interview with Heather Gwaltney. In your own words, who is Heather Gwaltney? <laughs> That's a very challenging question to answer, I guess, in a practical way. I, I see myself as um, a little bit eclectic. Uh, I would I affiliate being an artist, a businesswoman, an advocate for women, the environment, for the human race, and also uh, an educator. Wonderful. And you have this um, really beautiful work that we're going to be talking about in a minute. So those are my warm-up questions that are coming up next before we talk about specifically about your book, Be Kind and Take No S-H-I-T, A Woman's Guide to Balance, Power, and Joy. So my first warm-up question to you, Heather, is what is life? What is life to you? What is life? Hmm, that's another very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> um, see, life to me, I guess, is it's how our consciousness experiences things through our physical body. It's a little bit esoteric, but um, I would say that is my answer, and it's align in alignment with the mindfulness meditation. Right. And um, my follow-up question to that is, what do you think is the opposite of life? That's a good question, also complex. I think it's death, um, not in the physical sense per se, but um, perhaps when someone is apathetic or completely shut down and they feel nothing for life. Mm. So, and that, and it, it can be also thought of in a way as darkness. So life is perhaps light and death is darkness, but you need both mm. for existence, right? You need to understand the darkness or connect with it in order to appreciate the light. And as human beings, we have light and dark life and death as part of our human experience and our human existence. So true. Yes, so, so true. What is the meaning of freedom to you? That's a great question. And I love the word freedom. Freedom is when you're not a slave to the way people treat you or a slave to your circumstances. I think that our freedom and power comes where, when we make decisions about things that are happening to us. So our power is how we respond to life experiences and how we set intention and goals, how we create. So how we respond with a wise heart and how we create. Wow, I love that. At this time, what do you think is the world's greatest need? And what is your vision for a new reality? I love that question. Let me try to say this in a simple, fast yeah. way. I, I think that right now our world is heavily dominated by patriarchy 
And so it's dominated by men. In the U.S., 51% of our population is women, but we have a subordinate role in the culture and in the power dynamic. And we have uh, 20% of elected officials are women, 10% of media producers are women, so 90% are men, 80% of elected officials are men. Uh, then you have male dominated um, companies, the private sector is dominated by men, and the boards of even nonprofits are dominated by men. So that's, I think, that creates an imbalance. And when there's an imbalance, some of the outcomes of this particular imbalance, uh, war, corruption, uh, social injustice, and power that comes from ego. What I think would help with that is really women rising up and being in their power and partnering with men. So they are working together in leadership positions to solve the world's problems. And I think a lot of that has to do with power that comes from your heart. It's the will of the heart, not the will of the ego. Those are two very different things. Wow. That's beautifully said. Yeah, I love this idea or the idea of balance, the feminine energies and the masculine, right? Yes, yes. And, and I'm sorry, one more thing I wanted to add about that yeah. is that right now we have a situation where women are in leadership positions, but at a smaller population. And whenever you have a minority, the minority assimilates to the majority. Okay, so let's say, you know how you move to America from a different country and you're part of a minority group, you're going to want to assimilate to the majority culture. Um, if you are in a corporation and you're one manager and a manager of 10, you know, and nine of them are men and you're the only woman, you're going to assimilate. You're going to try to be like a man in order to survive in that environment. So that's why we need equal balance so that women are being authentic in their power because female leadership looks different than male leadership. So we need to connect with who we are and what our power is in an authentic way. Yeah, that is so true. I really like what you just said about being authentic, right? Mm -hmm. This is where everything gets started, really, mm -hmm. with um, the individual a change in the way of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. So my next question has to do with love. Um, what is love to you, Heather? Love to me is unity, where you feel connected and you do not feel separate from others. So I, I make a distinction. There's love and then there's ego. Ego is that sense of separateness where you're either better than or less than somebody. And then love is the unity where you're, you have, you're connected. Another interesting point you just made about the ego, that is not just feeling that we are better than others, but also the opposite, that we are less than others, right? That's a very exactly. interesting point and mm -hmm. a great message. <laughs> the ego is both, right? And um, my next question has to do with God. What, where, and who is God to you? Right. So this is a very interesting question. When I hear the term God, I think of a, a monotheistic patriarchal entity that is that is part of, you know, a, um, a Jewish or Christian or um, Muslim faith. How, however, and, and that is not, that's not my belief system. I, I think of a higher power or the divine that's pure light and, and goodness. Um, so that is something that I believe in. I just don't believe in a male entity that is higher than I am. I believe that the higher power, the divine is everywhere. And that, that gets back to the unity and the love piece. Right, right. Yes, a thousand times. And my last warm-up question, what do you think is the main purpose of your life? I think my calling is to 
contribute to a healthier and more joyful world through communications and mindfulness meditation. So that's that's my biggest calling and I'm I'm here to advocate on behalf of women, the environment and all of which contribute to the whole human race and ecosystem. So we're all connected so we can't really separate one from the other. Yes. Yes, so true. What was the inspiration and intention of writing your book, Be Kind and Take No (laughs) S-H-I-T? Sorry about that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, let's see. I I just started having um, visions, imagery of, of what I wanted to put together. As I said, I'm an advocate for women and women connecting with their authenticity. So I've done considerable work with energy, with meditation. I've been meditating and doing energy work for over 20 years. I've also been in the private sector and the nonprofit sector for over 20 years. So I've had so many of these varied experiences that I wanted to share with women so they could connect with their authenticity and their heart-centered power, and then gives them some practical tips about how to manifest those things in the day-to-day life um, and, and, and ultimately to just help raise my, my sisters up, if you will. Um, I think that it's women, part of women's um, requirement is that they support each other. Uh, we have to support each other if we're going to move forward. Mm, so true. So true. And that is... Um, a point that you made earlier about women, uh, we have adopted this um, different way of thinking to um, to adapt in a society that's dominated by different kinds of energies. And now it's like this return, this unlearning, going back to ourselves in a way to understand it's all about the balance and not trying to push away anything or I believe in, um, in harmony. And like you said, everything's connected. So let's work together. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk about mindful meditation. How did you discover mindful meditation and what is your own experience with it? <laughs> My first introduction to mindfulness was in, gosh, it was over 20 years ago, and I dated someone who was into it. So I was just curious. I have insatiable curiosity. So I was curious about it and then started experimenting with it. I went to mindfulness is analogous to Vipassana meditation and insight meditation. So those three terms are interchangeable. Like the the style of meditation is the same with all of those three labels. So I experimented with it. I, I would meditate for maybe 10 minutes a couple times a week. It was very uncomfortable. I didn't know why I was doing it but I just stuck with it. And now 20 years later, I meditate once or twice a day even, and for 30 to 60 minutes every single day, I'm either doing meditation or energy work. That sounds um, like a great method of meditation has been. I just did, there are so many kinds and I don't know Mm -hmm. about all of them. Uh, I heard about mindful meditation, so but I'm not familiar with the steps and how it is done. So I'll be asking you that question later and going through uh, the, the whole technique. Uh, for now, before I ask you more questions on mindful meditation, I have, I think, uh, two other topics that's in your book. One is about highly sensitive people. So talk to me about highly sensitive people. What is to be highly sensitive and how do we know when we are highly sensitive? That's a good question. Um, So highly sensitive people have an overactive nervous system. So that means that they can pick up on things, sensate things, sound, smell, sight, all of these things they pick up on and they feel more deeply. So they can walk in a room. Let's say you're at a party and there are 50 people at that party in that room. A highly sensitive person will walk into the room and they will literally feel the energies of the people. And 
that can be a great thing because it helps that person to read people and adapt and listen deeply and uh, process things deeply. So that's the positive side of it. The challenging side of it is that it can, it can be very overwhelming. And the highly sensitive person sometimes uh, over internalizes other people's experiences and their desires. Like a highly sensitive person is usually a people pleaser. Like they know they can read someone and they know how to respond. Um, At the same time, it it can be, like I said, overwhelming and they can lose themselves in that experience. So it can make the highly sensitive person uh, more insecure, more self-critical, that sort of thing, and exhausted uh, because they're taking on other people's problems and energy, et cetera. Uh, the, the, The good thing or the way to kind of manage the sensitivity is to do things like meditation, to have alone time, and to 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 have these interventions to keep yourself healthy, um, mentally and energetically. But another good thing about the highly sensitive person or the HSP is that they're very responsive to interventions. So they they learn very very quickly, and are resilient. So if they just expose themselves to positivity or therapy and or energy work or meditation, then they can really thrive. Would you also call them empaths or empathetic Mm -hmm. people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, an empath. Yeah, the same. Well, Mm -hmm. I think the empath can feel deeply and sometimes will take on other people's stuff. A highly sensitive person, though, is like their nervous system is reactive. So it's physiological. Oh, it's biological. It's actually. Bio- yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, so there's a difference, right? Oh, one has to do a lot with emotions and the other one is actually, it's in the brain. It's something that's happening, actually happening in the brain. That is interesting. Yeah, your nervous system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yep. And um, something that you mentioned in your book, very interesting about how beliefs becomes our reality or how beliefs are our reality. Talk to me about that, Heather. Right. So we're we're going back to the biology. Whenever you have a thought, it triggers a neurotransmitter. Okay. So a neurotransmitter is a chemical message that communicates within your brain and it communicates through your nervous system to your body. Okay. So first the thought then it triggers the neurotransmitter, it travels throughout the brain, and then throughout your body, through the nervous system, okay? And the more, and, and then it, it, it connects to the cells of your body, these neurotransmitters. And when you have negative thoughts, repetitive negative thoughts, your cells are more receptive to negative thoughts, If you have more positive thoughts that travel through your body, your cells are more receptive to positive thoughts. So mindfulness meditation, I call it an intervention. It's a way to manage your thoughts, manage your experience so that you have, you're more receptive to the positivity. Yeah. Wow. So it goes back to that um, idea, everything's connected, this connectivity. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're, they, this, is, this, is an, this is an interesting concept. I, it just occurred to me to share. But so people think that our mind is in our heads, but really our minds are in our whole bodies. You know, your head is connected to your body with your neck. <laughs> so it is one That's funny. entity. And so I think it's just, it's like, like your cells are smart. Your body is smart. You, sometimes you have pain because your body is communicating to you. You process thoughts through your body. So it's, it's really interesting to realize that the mind is in the body. It's not just in the head. Wow. I never heard that before. That is uh, refreshing and that resonates true to me. There's no location, right? We usually kind of think about the brain, but it's uh, it's the whole organism. Everything's the receptor. Exactly. Exactly. Of course. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. 
Um, and then my um, other observation here about in your book was about forgiveness. So what is the connection between forgiveness and transformation? Okay, I love forgiveness. It is amazing. And uh, a myth about forgiveness is that you have to ask someone for forgiveness or you ha- or someone has to apologize before you can forgive them. Like that's that's the biggest assumption and myth about forgiveness. And it has nothing to do with that other person. So forgiveness is when you let go of the pain associated with that experience with the other person. So that person doesn't have to apologize. They can be alive. They can be deceased. They can, you can never talk to them, um, them again. It's a completely internal process that you go through. And another thing that's really important with forgiveness is not to rush the process. If you're angry or hurt or in pain about an experience, it's really important to acknowledge that pain and or anger and allow it to be there and hold it with gentle kindness and process it through your body and then allow it to move itself and shift and then you can let go but you cannot bypass the natural response that you have to an experience forgiveness is not an understanding of a moment and then that's it it's actually a process in a way Exactly. And, and it's, it all, it's all about you, not you personally, but if someone is feeling right. pain or anger, it's all about them and how they manage that pain and anger and, and really practicing compassion with it and holding it with kind awareness and, and, then, and then letting it go naturally. And when you are able to process it, it's a relief. You just, you let go of dead weight and there's usually a healing, like there's learning that's there through the process. Yeah. That's another interesting point about healing that uh, it goes back to self-knowledge, self-awareness. It comes back to us always. We are the ones responsible really to heal ourselves. It's not out there. Most of us like I have looked outside for healing and never really worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about meditation. What is meditation and what is the science behind meditation? Okay, well, I, I'm in love with meditation. <laughs> Mindfulness yeah. meditation is, is my medicine. I think it's pure love and beauty. Um, so meditation itself is really old. It's been around since at least 5000 BCE. And that's the documented knowledge of it of its existence. So it started in India, and it has it has accompanied, accompanied followed many different religions. So Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, Judaism, and Christianity. So there's a history of meditation with all of those religions. And then with a mindfulness piece, I teach it in a very secular way. So I don't associate it with religion. I just bring that up so that people know that you can practice any number of religions and still practice meditation in parallel. Um, You can also practice meditation if you're an atheist. It doesn't matter. Okay. So, and that's something else that I really like about it. Um, Okay. So what is it? I, I make a distinction between mindfulness and meditation. Those two words, they are very much related, but they have a different focus. So meditation is very much about refocusing your attention and building your consciousness. And that's usually through a repetitive act. And the mindfulness is about breathing or the, the, the type of meditation that I practice is about breathing. So the repetition is your breath and you refocus, refocus on your breath and it, it acts as an anchor to you. And breath is always accessible to you because you have to breathe in order to live. So you can always refocus on your breath at any time of day. Um, So that's another wonderful piece about it. The mindfulness is about, um, they, in the, in the mindfulness community, they talk about the two wings of a bird. And that means that the one wing is kindness and the other wing is awareness. So 
the intention is to practice both kindness and awareness in the present moment with whatever experience you're having. So you allow whatever you are experiencing to be there and you hold it with kind awareness and you focus on your breathing. Um, in terms of the science, the scientific piece, I can get into the health benefits a little bit. Is that what you'd like me to talk about? Is that helpful to talk about the scientific yes. health benefits? Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there are a ton of health benefits. Okay, I'll start with the brain. So when you're meditating, eight regions of the brain light up. You're activating mostly the uh, prefrontal cortex, which is uh, meditators refer to as the consciousness part of the brain. It's more developed. It's more uh, advanced functions. So you're, you're activating your brain while you're meditating. Okay, so that's one thing. And another thing you're doing is you're slowing down your respiratory system. So you're reducing blood pressure and your heart rate. So that also then translates into a lower risk of heart disease heart attack and stroke. Okay. So slowing down the respiratory system, that's another one. I mean, there are tons. Okay. So then meditation also increases good hormones. Okay. Hormones are also regulated by those neurotransmitters that we were talking about. So the good hormones, serotonin and endorphins. So it increases serotonin and endorphins, the happy hormones, happy and relaxed hormones, DHEA and GH. Those are the youth hormones. So literally, <laughs> if you meditate, it helps you stay younger. Look, I'm younger mm. looking. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm surprised if everyone in LA is not doing this, everyone in Hollywood. You know? <laughs> and, right, um, yeah, right. and, it, and it reduces cortisol, the, the um, stress hormone. So it reduces the stress hormone and then enhances all of these great hormones. The last piece I will say is that meditation is also used to treat depression, anxiety, PTSD, and um, chronic pain. So it's a really wonderful intervention and no side effects. It's free and there are no side effects. <laughs> no, no, no negative uh. <laughs> right. That's the best medication, isn't it, out there? Um, the question that comes to mind is about uh, the challenges. Why do so many of us resist uh, meditation or even to be in silence? Why do you think this happens? That's a great question. We are programmed to fill space and to respond immediately. I remember I was working for a bank and I would say, when is this due? And they told me yesterday. Wow. <laughs> say, well, yesterday's wow. not really <laughs> a uh, legitimate <laughs> timeline. Uh, and um, yes. so we're, we're constantly bombarded by information tight deadlines, meeting goals, measuring success and being in our heads and doing things quickly and also being very verbal, like being extroverted and speaking out and standing out. Those things are rewarded in Western culture and mindfulness meditation is completely counterculture. It's not part of our cultural norms. We're not program to do it. We don't know how to do it. It's uncomfortable. But um, yeah, so that's, that's where the rub is. That's people just need to learn and experiment and see the benefits. That's true. Yeah. All it takes really is uh, trying one, one time or twice. And then, yeah, you can see the, it's pretty, it's fast too, right, Heather? So it's right there. I love the, the, the breathing techniques with it because breathing is just so basic and we tend to forget. That's kind of interesting how we just forget to breathe. Mm -hmm. And that's what we go back to. So in a way, it's not even learning, it's unlearning. Is there a difference between, do you see a difference between meditation and prayer? Okay, another good question. I see prayer is speaking to the divine and setting intentions, like maybe a, a secular type of prayer is setting intentions because it's the will of your heart. Um, but if you believe in a higher power, prayer is, is great and it's speaking. Meditation is listening. 
So it's, it's being quiet and allowing. And I find that when I stop talking, when I shut up, <laughs> information comes come to me and you create more space to process things. Yeah, yeah. And that's so true. More space. Yeah, that's a great word, a way of saying that, explaining that. Um, so before you show me how to, um, to meditate for beginners, w- would this be for beginners? Yeah, if I do a very brief guided meditation with you, it's for anyone who, yeah, beginners, newbies, experienced meditators, it's for anyone. Oh, anyone. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you for clarifying that. And um, I have another question before that practice. Um, is it the breathing, what is the difference between breathing through the mouth and the nose? Is there a difference or does it matter? I'm so glad you asked that question. A lot of people breathe through their mouth, I think. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but um, there, is, there is a difference. And with meditation, the goal is to breathe in and out through your nose. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Breathing through your nose slows you down even more. And so that helps with the whole process of meditation, but it also allows your lungs to process more oxygen your lungs and the cells in your body to process more oxygen because it takes a longer time for the air to come out. Um, Also, you have very small hairs in your nose. You you have the bigger nose hairs that that you have to manage. (laughs) You also have have little ones that are cilia. (laughs) And they keep billions of particles out of your body every day. So they act as like like little mini uh, filtering systems. So when you're breathing through your nose, you're filtering these foreign particles out of your body or that come from the air so they don't reach your body. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. That makes sense. Pretty cool. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Now we know I was doing that here. Uh, breathing through my mouth. I don't, you see, we're not even aware of it, exactly. like my case. So now that you talk to me, I'll be doing this more often. Yeah, and yes, breathing, I'm becoming yeah, aware exactly. of it. Exactly. And breathing through your mouth also um, creates snoring and sleep apnea. So if, if, oh. if you breathe through your nose, that's a good practice, even when you're sleeping, if you can get in the habit. Right. Yeah, so during the day, if you have the good practice of breathing through the nose, we'll do that automatically while we're sleeping, right? Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, right? <laughs> Can control everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh-huh. Um, and then um, before even the practice, um, let me ask you another question that I think it might be helpful. Is there a, a goal? Like what are we looking for when we're preparing and um, we me- actually meditate? Are we actually trying to reach a goal, get somewhere? That's another really good question. Meditation is more of a calling than it is a task. And I I just want to say that because it's not something that you want to force yourself to do. And it's also not an end state that's reached. It's, it's a practice. And you always meet yourself where you are. Um, and that means that it, it's good to practice. You will see more benefits from it the more you do it. A daily practice is the best case scenario, or at very least weekly. But again, some people don't have access to quiet time, especially during the coronavirus. They have their families around them constantly. So it's either family or work. Uh, so one thing that I encourage people to do is do little things. It can be pausing, stopping what you're doing, taking three deep breaths. It can be if if you're with your baby, hold your baby, breathe with your baby for five minutes. Um, If you're having anxiety, put your hand on your heart, repeat the word kindness or repeat a, a phrase or a word that comforts you just three times. You know, do these little micro mindfulness practices. And and if you do have time to sit, sit, sit for five minutes in quiet. You can also, the, the, um, the most common posture for mindfulness meditation is sitting, whether you're in a chair or on a cushion, but you can also practice it while you're standing, while you're walking or while you're, while you're lying down. So it's very accessible. It's a very accessible pro- uh, practice. 
Yeah, I like that. That's uh, also flexible, right? We can choose different ways of practicing. So let's do it. Um, how long would, would the meditation for now for this episode take? I think about five minutes. Okay. So yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I'm Great. Ready. Would you like to start? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So find a, find a comfortable seated position. Okay. And if you're in a private setting, close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. But if you're listening to this in your car or on public transportation, feel free to open your eyes slightly with a downward gaze or keep them fully open. Put your feet flat on the ground, hands flat on your lap. And engage your stomach muscles just enough to support your lower back and sit upright. Relax your shoulders. And take three very slow, deep breaths. Again, try to breathe through your nose, both on the inhalation and exhalation, if that's available to you. And you may notice that the air is cooler on the inhalation and warmer on the exhalation. Yeah. And notice the air filling and expanding your lungs. If you get distracted from breathing, just gently bring yourself back. And then see what you notice. You may have a thought, a feeling, or a sensation in your body. It could be planning for work, stress, a tightening of the throat or chest, perhaps a joyful memory of a loved one or a tingling in the hands or feet. Just see if you can allow that experience to be there with kind awareness. Take three more slow, deep breaths. What else do you notice? And how would you identify it? Mm. That's so, oh boy. One thing that came to mind is like, you need to be doing this more often. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the mind told me. <laughs> the whole body really, as we mentioned before. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the sounds, everything, your voice became a lot more uh, noticeable. Uh, everything around me, it's amplified in, uh, in a beautiful way, like a symphony. Yeah, mm. everything coming mm. together in harmony. But yeah, I, I noticed the thinking about, uh, yeah, you got to do this more often. <laughs> Thank you, Heather, <laughs> for the reminder. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> my pleasure um so uh, going back to the the, the the interview now it's um seems like it's different somehow too <laughs> um there's something that you mentioned um about you mentioned the word enlightenment so i guess i wanted to ask you that question what is enlightenment to you enlightenment to me is pure peace and unity where the concept of self dissolves and is no longer there. So the concept and feeling of separateness is no longer there and completely at peace, calm, and connection. Right, right. Uh, let me make a correction. 
uh, you mentioned in your book. So you didn't mention the word enlightenment in the conversation, but you mentioned in your book. That's why I asked. I would like to ask mm -hmm. you my final questions. But before that, would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? I want to emphasize the need for kindness. I talked about breathing and the mindfulness, two wings of a bird, the kindness and awareness and balancing those two. I just want to emphasize the need for kindness and kindness towards ourselves and kindness towards others. Because if you don't have that, you, you, you can't even hold space for difficult experiences. You cannot heal. You can't see and be honest with yourself about what's real. So kindness first. Thank you so much for your message. It's uh, not just needed, but it's the truth. It resonates truth to my heart. And I really appreciate that. Listening to it over and over and over again. <laughs> it's in the end all about love, right? So my final questions to you, Heather, what is success to you? What is to be successful? I think it's just to be in alignment with the world so that you are living a life that you value and that is rewarding to you and that you are learning and in service of others in a way that also serves you. Um, even with altruism, altruism is when you, you give with no intention of getting anything back. At the same time, you usually feel good about yourself it, during and after the act of, of giving. So in that way, it's not a selfish act, but you are getting something out of it. And so I think it's really important for people to learn how they can give to others and serve the greater good in a way that also brings them joy and fulfillment. Um, I think that's really the ticket. That's, that's, if people can figure that out and figure out how to do it in a way that perhaps even fe allows them to feed themselves with money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. stuff, if you can figure out how to do, do good by doing or do well by doing good, that's, that's success. I love that. That makes me think about loving ourselves and at the same time, loving others. Yeah, that might be the practice itself. Um, my other question is about lessons. Um, what was the hardest lesson to learn about yourself as of today? <laughs> How much time? <laughs> right. That's another book. <laughs> right. Uh, oh. Just, I think that, that pain is your greatest teacher. And that's a very meditation thing to say. Oh gosh, the greatest lesson. Oh goodness. Um, I think for me, gentle kindness towards myself is the one of my biggest challenges. I, I internalize a lot as a highly sensitive person. I'm also highly analytical. And um, so, yeah, just that's what, one reason why I do the mindfulness meditation is just to really practice that gentle kindness. Yeah, and that's... Uh... A practice for all of us, really. Yeah, and like the way you reminded me of, of meditating and breathing deeper. That's being kind to myself. And I, and I tried to practice that, really tried, but I forgot mm -hmm. about it, that part. <laughs> so we are here to remind one another in a way, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, do you believe in unconditional self-love? Oh, God, that's another good question. I think that love is a practice. And we can feel love towards ourselves, but that's just a feeling. That's not permanent. I think that we have moments when we feel love towards ourselves. I think what's really important to, to do, however, is to, to practice the love. And what I mean by that is to do things that serve you and serve your well-being, things that serve your joy, things that serve your health, things of that nature, and having boundaries with people that hurt you. Um, meditation is a, a, a practice. It's a gift. So that's an exercise and um, going to fun movies, being with your friends, cracking up, doing things that you really enjoy. 
uh, these are all ways of, of loving ourselves and allowing ourselves to feel pain, allowing ourselves to sit in darkness and hold that with kind awareness. Those are all things that we can do to practice self-love. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, what is another word for healing? That's a great question. Um, I, associate healing with a shift that occurs and a letting go of some kind. So it's, it's a transformation of an existing thought, feeling, body sensation. So you allow whatever needs to be healed to be there, hold it with a kind awareness and really create more space for it to be there. Then what normally happens is that it will expand. It will expand and intensify your experience will, and then it will leave your body. Okay. So that's an ideal scenario. And sometimes that can happen in 20 seconds. It can happen in 20 seconds through meditation. Sometimes you have deeper wounds and you'll have like little micro healings. And sometimes it takes six months for something to work itself out of your body. So, and then of course, some people experience extreme trauma and chronic pain, and um, it, then the person needs to do different types of healing work and maybe medication and therapy. You know what I mean? But you know, there are different levels of pain. But um, healing is is when when you let go, when there's a release. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, the word you use, let go, right? If you knew you would die soon, meaning leaving the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything differently? I don't know. I, I, I feel like so much of my life purpose is in serving others, like providing something that is a gift to other people. And I, I did a documentary, I did the book, and that is a gift. That is something that I will leave behind. So I, I feel like I'm at this point in, in my life, like I'm changing careers a little bit so, and so I can be uh, more in alignment with my values and be of service to people in a way that is more authentic. Um, so that's all I can do. And that's, that's what I'm offering up to the world. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. And you are. Yeah. Very much. You just reminded me again, again, again about the power of meditation, right? And breathing, which is, uh, it's a gift. So I, I really thank you again for that, that reminder. Do you believe in life after death? Yeah. So I, how do I believe um, about that? I, I believe that life is cyclical. Like when you throw a piece of garbage in the trash can, it doesn't disappear. It just goes back into the earth. Um, and like our energy, like our energy, it gets recycled. So I think that our bodies die, they go back into the earth, and then somehow our consciousness, our spirit, it gets recycled somehow. So it goes into another physical form. Um, that's about all I can really say. The rest is completely mysterious. <laughs> and I don't claim to know any more than that, but that's, that's kind of my belief system. <laughs> Does it bring, um, to believe in these things, bring you comfort? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's just, I guess it's a belief system. It makes sense to me. Um, like I love composting because composting, you, you, you discard food scraps, right? Which are considered kind of garbage. Yeah. And then you put them in a, in a pile and then it creates organic fertilizer that you can use to grow new things. And that's also like alchemy and transformation. It's so beautiful. And that to me is like a metaphor for life that we're constantly getting recycled <laughs> as part of this somehow. circular yeah. experience. Yeah, somehow. I like what you said. It makes sense, right? Because that would make sense, right? And my last question to you, what are three things about life you know for sure? Okay, three things. 
Um, one thing is that I know for sure is that I will never know everything. <laughs> oh, yes. The second thing is the more I know, the more I realize that I don't know. <laughs> and, um, uh, the third thing is that there are far more mysteries than there are, um, you know, laws and truths. Like there, there are always more mysteries than there are solutions and laws. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like how humble you are. I know you know what you know. That's for sure. <laughs> but yeah, that's wonderful too. Thank you, Heather. Thank you so much for this conversation, for your presence, for the practice of reminder of mindful meditation and your wisdom. Thank you. Aw, you're welcome. My pleasure. And my final, final question is, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Well, I have a website. It's heathergwaltney.com. Just my name. And if you're struggling with my name, you can also do a Google search, uh, bewellservices.net. So it's .net, bewellservices.net. It will take you to the same place. Wonderful. Thank you so much again. And we'll talk soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Heather D. Gwaltney, please visit her website, heathergwaltney.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. I want to thank the Patreon members, Lawrence McGrath, Mark Basden, Terry Clayton, and Aidan Vickrock. Thank you again for listening, and bye for now. Mm-hmm.